Hello, everyone. We now uh, turn to the first panel discussion of the day, which is on online safety. Um, before we start, by way of introduction, I'm Alex Birchall. I'm from Fleischmann Hill Fishburn. We've been helping to organize the event today, so I hope you all enjoyed your break. Thank you all for coming back. And yeah, so this, this first panel. Um, in the Internet Safety Strategy Green Paper, which was released in October of last year, um, the UK government pledged to ensure that Britain is the safest place to be online. I know we've already spoken about that a little bit today. We've assembled a panel of experts to talk about how this objective could be made a reality, um, especially looking forward to the white paper, which we know will be introduced early next year. So we've got Professor Sonia Livingston from the LSE. We've got Douglas White from the Carnegie Trust. David Wright from the UK Safer Internet Centre, Vicky Schottbolt from Parent Zone, Jody Ginsberg from the Index on Censorship, and Andrew Honeyman from DCMS. And before we get started, I'd just like to talk quickly about the format. You might see that we've split the panel up. Um, we've got three sat in the centre here, and then we've got four sat at the side. Now, the three in the centre are going to be discussing the key issues today. So they're the speakers, OK? And then people on the side, they're in listening mode for now. Um, this is a, it's called a goldfish bowl format. And the idea is to make this as participatory and dynamic as possible. So I'm going to introduce the session in a second. And the, the three people are going to debate the key issue. And then when one of the speakers here would like to swap in and join the discussion, they'll raise their hand. I'll make it clear they'd like to swap in, and they'll swap in with someone at the table. And the idea here is to keep the discussion as tight and focused as possible, and to try and ensure that everybody gets to, to speak on time. Um, many of you might have seen this, this goldfish bowl format before. If not, like I say, keywords participation. And in that spirit, it would be great if we could get questions from the audience throughout the session. Okay, so the session is split into three different 20 minute sections. The first is on policing and prosecuting online hate crime. The second is on cyberbullying and online marginalization. And the third, <coughs> excuse me, is on the upcoming UK internet safety strategy. Now, we're not going to take questions at the end. We're going to take questions throughout. And if there's a lull in conversation, what we're going to do, a few from the audience to pose questions to the panel. And we'll try and keep it, as I say, keep it dynamic, keep it flowing, keep it participatory. So, I think. That's all I need to say. The less you hear from me in this sort of format, the better. I'm going to ensure that we keep on time, that the sections <clears throat> are respected. Um, but I think it really is down to the panelists and yourself to keep this discussion flowing. So let's get started. I'll kick off with a question, and then it's for the panelists to take it forward. So quite an open-ended one. Who decides what is a hate crime where only words or threats and not physical violence are involved? Where does the boundary lie between legitimate offense and hate speech? So quite open-ended, and if the panel could kick off, please. Excellent, and we have 20 minutes in which to solve this conundrum. I'm Jodie Ginsberg, I'm the Chief Executive of Index on Censorship, and this is an issue that preoccupies us a great deal. And I'm just going to give you some background so that we can understand how complex and difficult this issue is in understanding the boundaries between what's offensive and what's criminal. And I think the easiest way to understand how difficult this is proving for people to understand is the vast uptick we've had in the number of people being arrested for posting allegedly offensive messages online. Currently, the rate is about nine people a day being arrested for posting allegedly offensive messages online. But actually, only about half of, investi about half of the investigations are dropped before prosecutions are brought, and even fewer of those come to prosecution. And I think that demonstrates how little understanding there is, not just among the general public, but among law enforcement and the police about what constitutes um, a hate crime as, uh, and a, a speech crime online. Uh, and typified by the example of the West Yorkshire Police, which posted something on Facebook saying, being insulting, abusive, or offensive can and will result in prosecution under the Malicious Communications Act. That's actually not true. Being insulting online will not result in prosecution under Malicious Communications Act. Being grossly offensive can result in prosecution, but not being insulting. And I think the fact that the West Yorkshire Police themselves didn't know that 
uh, typifies the confusion around the difference between what's offensive and what's actually criminal. The CPS issued some very good guidelines about this, about prosecutable speech, but I think this lack of understanding remains and is becoming more pervasive as we start to think about the harms, the additional harms that there might be online and the ways to deal with them. Hello everyone, I'm Barbara Bukowska, I'm a Senior Director for Law and Policy at Article 19, which is International Freedom of Expression Organization, and we also deal a lot with the issue of hate speech. So to answer Alex's question, who decides what is hate speech uh, and what is not, we should actually not be asking this question. We should be asking what is the level of severity of certain speech which warranties restriction. And actually, international law, as well as um, the, you know, a lot of international standards, already offer the solution to, to this problem. And the solution is as that we should not be treating all so-called hate speech with the same, uh, same response. We should distinguish that, uh, even under international law, there are different types that warrant different uh, responses. So on the top, and we always visualize it as a sort of like pyramid of severity, on the top of it, is incitement to genocide, which the states have to restrict and are obliged to restrict it under criminal law. Underneath, there is incitement to violence, discrimination, and hostility, and again, this can be and should be restricted under criminal law. Underneath that, we have other types of hate speech which are problematic, let's say, in terms of schools or in the workplace, and again, and again this can be restricted. But then there is also a huge pool, and actually probably the lar a largest area of speech, which is problematic in terms of tolerance, equality, social cohesion. However, it's perfectly legal. And this should not be restricted. However, it should be addressed. And the solution to addressing this type of the largest speech and the speech which also we see frequently online, and also as Jody mentioned, should be um, tackled through other means, which do not lie in technology. And this is the problem, that we think that the technology will solve all these problems. Well, and restricting the speech, removing it, making it more difficult to find, will address the problem, but will not. So we need to link the solutions to those problems which we are seeing online, to solutions such as improving equality in the society, education, um, dealing with uh, the issues such as uh, supporting the Equality Commission and also education through all kinds of areas in the workplace, in schools, and also un addressing the underlying problems in society which lead to inequality, such as poverty, such as things in the austerity which cut uh, social services to the people and which lead to mar marginaliz marginalization. So uh, my response to your question would be combination of technological solution for those speeches which can be legitimately restricted and then dealing with other approaches to those which have to be deal, dealt with other means. But I also want to touch on the, uh, on the, on the and this is actually very important we, we need to discuss, to the topic of this uh, discussion, which is how to make Britain the safest place to be online. And from Article 19 perspective, this is a profoundly dangerous idea. You can't make Britain the safest place online until you turn it into North Korea and disconnect it from open and decentralized internet. So we should not be talking about this issue in terms of security and safety, but in terms of protection of human rights and making, that, uh, making sure that the rule of law and human rights protection applies to online uh, sphere. My name is David Wright, um, a director of the UK Safe Internet Centre. Um, UK Centre, the UK Safe Internet Centre, is a partnership of three charities. Um, uh, so we are we're appointed uh, by the European Commission as the National Awareness Centre. Uh, we're one of 32 national centres uh, across Europe. We have a number of obligations, um, and those are uh, around managing illegal child abuse content online, which is what the Internet Watch Foundation does, one of the three charities. Uh, and so clearly have relevance in this, this particular subject um, around management of uh, what is illegal, say illegal child abuse uh, content online. Uh, we also operate a helpline, um, which is what we, so from SWGFL, do on behalf of the centre that supports the UK's children's workforce, those working and volunteering with children around online safety issues. 
uh, and again, kind of relevance here is that helpline, which has been established over the course of the last eight years, um, is uh, actually launching what is a national hub for reporting harmful content. Um, so we've seen much in the news recently around um, uh, around abusive uh, content online, uh, and so uh, so this the national re uh, reporting hub being uh, launched uh, later uh, next month. Um, and the third pillar, um, which is one of awareness raising, um, uh, so trying to highlight all to do with issues around online safety, um, given some of that, that, that context, uh, and so through things like, so many of you may well recognise things like Safer Internet Day, uh, which is going to be in its 14th year, um, which will be on 5th of February uh, next, uh, next, uh, next year, um, so uh, in terms of its progress from a UK perspective, we're very, very active on a global um, perspective in terms of raising awareness for, through things like Safe Internet Day, so 48% of 8 to 12 year olds last year, this year, um, uh, recognised Safe Internet Day and, uh, and had conversations around it. Again, relevant to, to this particular subject, and there's an example perhaps as well around uh, in, in terms of uh, prosecuting hate, line, uh, hate crime. Uh, online is uh, over the course of the last three years, we've also been operating uh, a helpline that supports victims of revenge porn, which is a terrible title, uh, but, but it, is, uh, it is what it is. And so we do that on behalf of the Government Equalities Office. And that coincided uh, with the introduction of new laws in uh, April 2015 to make it an offence to post without consent um, intimate images. Uh, and so over the course of the uh, just over three years, three and a half years that we've been supporting or operating the helpline, we've so far removed 20 or had 21,000 uh, images removed, uh, which are uh, identified as RP, uh, RP images. Now, the, the images in themselves are legal. Um, the the offence is to post uh, without consent. Um, uh, and so uh, we've been navigating uh, terms and conditions because many providers do not want these uh, sorts of images on their, their, their services either, so using those mechanisms to remove that particular content. Uh, but a big uh, section of those that we support too is the police uh, and their understanding in terms of what RP, these new RP laws um, actually uh, mean. Uh, and so uh, through some form of, uh, or through research that we've, we've recently done, concluded that the vast majority, over 90% of police don't actually recognise um, th these new laws. And we have actually seen it being used uh, incorrectly as well. So prosecution of children uh, to, to do this in terms of sharing of in, indecent images, which is what they would be classified as. So um, I, I would very much echo the, the, uh, the, the, the training, the awareness, particularly across law enforcement, about what these laws actually mean. And I just cite this as, as, a, as, as a specific um, uh, example. Can I just jump in there? I think it's really important here to... to emphasize that we already have an awful lot of laws and legislation that deals with particularly content and speech. And I think we need to be very careful. The tendency is often to create more laws where none are actually needed because the impetus is always to be seen to be do, do, doing something. And I think uh, as we're thinking about the white paper, which I know we're going to talk about, one of the things that I think we need to think about very carefully is whether new legislation is needed, whether regulation is the preferred option, and if regulation is the preferred option, who does the regulation and what is, what is the role of the government in that? Um, because at the moment, what we're doing is we're sort of suggesting that th the legislation, the protections don't exist for, for these things online, when actually they're often, very often they do to deal with harassment, abusive content. But what's happening is we're conflating all of these terms. So we're conflating abusive with harmful, harassment with offence, offence with hate, um, and legal and illegal. And all of these things are being conflated in a way that people feel that not enough is already controlled or legislated on, where actually the most egregious forms of behaviour, if you like, to, related to speech online are already being regulated are an, and already crimes. I think, sorry, just to jump in here, I think some speakers would like to swap out and swap yeah. in, so if we could just quickly oh. do that. Who's coming? Come. Now, this is the most energetic panel I've ever been on in my life. I feel like I'm more in a 
goldfish tank than a goldfish bowl, but there we are. Um, I find myself with questions, and I don't know if I'm allowed to do that as a panelist, but I find myself with questions for our, our, our first group of goldfish. And that question is really based on the work that we do with uh, parents around radicalization and extremism as part of a program that's called uh, the Resilient Families Program. And that program is really working primarily with mothers, but with children as well, but primarily with mothers to help them feel more confident about protecting their children from some of the negative influences that they might be exposed to online. Uh, certainly up to and including the risk of being radicalized. And what we know from working with those families is that they are extraordinarily nervous of looking for information about that subject matter because they feel as though they're going to have a red flag if they do anything even as active as, as Googling a question about that. So it's an incredibly sensitive and difficult topic to work with families on. And their pushback to us is where are the protections? So if you can't tell me when hateful language becomes hateful, how am I supposed to tell my child? Where is that line? And if it's not law, and I hear, I hear the complexity of doing the legal piece, and, and I absolutely, I have a 20-year-old son who bangs on about freedom of expression at every given opportunity. I absolutely understand that importance to, to steer us away from North Korea. I don't personally feel as though making us a safe place to go online equates to us being North Korea, but I absolutely understand that, that position. If it's not the law, if we can't get to that place, then whose responsibility is it? Does, it, d does the natural conclusion of that <coughs> argument take us to a place where we say, actually, the platforms that are allowing those sorts of discussions to take place have to carry some responsibility for the discussions that they're having, that they're allowing on their platforms, does it mean that we have to see them as publishers? Because I can certainly say to a parent that they can rely on, let's say, good old auntie, the BBC, not to air views that are, if not legally hateful, certainly hateful in ways that parents would understand it. But I absolutely cannot say that to them about platforms like WhatsApp, Snapchat, Facebook, any of those platforms. So if it's not legal, if we can't define hateful in legal terms, who's going to take responsibility for what families would recognize as hateful? Can Sorry, I, that's a question, can I not a comment. Can I jump in there, if I may? Um, and um, this is kind of going to start blurring into what we're going to say in the next part of the conversation, so I'll let Alex tell us when we're moving into the next conversation. But I think the question of who is, who's going to do this is, um, I hope the kind of priority of this group to really be um, debating. And um, some of you might have seen that um, earlier this week uh, at LSE, we launched a proposal for an independent platform agency. Um, it was largely in the context of, quote, fake news, but I think the argument for some kind of independent body um, is now really mounting on all sides, and lots of different uh, organizations I know in, in the last few months have been trying to deliberate about all kinds of problems um, in relation to online harms and um, are proposing that we need a new body to do this. So I think um, how that represents an answer to um, Vicky's question and Alex's is um, that we are seeing the platforms taking all kinds of action already in relation to all kinds of online harms. And um, I don't want to disparage the efforts that they're taking, but by and large, they don't do so in a way that meets the expectations of um, a public solution to a national problem, which is that the solution, the um, uh, steps that are taken and the processes that have gone through should be um, transparent, yes, that's important, but transparency is by no means enough, accountable, fair, um, and inclusive in terms of who it is that um, uh, has the chance to influence that process um, and engage with it. And civil society um, is rarely or never included in the platform solutions. Um, and those who are affected, um, uh, and a lot of my research is on children, so wonderful some of the things that the platforms are doing to keep children safe from online harms, but children are not involved in that process, despite um, it being their right to be consulted on all matters that affect them under the um, Convention on the Rights of the Child, among other 
um, legal standards. So the, I think the case is really mounting, and um, to, not to jump forward to our third debate, but um, uh, you know, the, the, I think the calls are, are widespread that we need some legislative solution, not necessarily to um, step in and regulate um, speech or actions, but to set up a body that has the oversight and the responsibility to really investigate some of these very difficult lines um, between what is offensive um, and what is harmful and what is illegal. Gosh, so much, so much there from my panelists. So I, I guess the, for the, go, the goldfish analogy, my challenge is not to have that two-second memory and try and think about what, what are all the really kind of pertinent points and significant points everyone's made and what, which of those I might choose to respond to. So, um, so I get a, a couple of reflections then. These are not necessarily kind of linear or joined up. So... Um, Ofcom published some very helpful research in September uh, this year, which looked at people's experience of harm online. And within that, they tried to kind of break out a little bit between some of these definitions, between what is offensive, what is abusive, what is bullying, what is hate speech. I'm not sure quite exactly what, um, what, how, what definitions they put around each of those, but I'm sure, they're, I'm sure they're publicly available or available from Ofcom if, if people are interested. And, they, and I, th I think they recorded that hate speech was at, at around 6% of UK adults said they'd experienced it, that within kind of a recent, a recent period of time, which percentage-wise sounds fairly low, but actually in, in terms of numbers of people, that will be that significant numbers of people have experienced that. And then I think back to the point Barbara was making, that I think what's really important within that is the, the severity of harm experienced as a result of that particular type of content or interaction is clearly quite significant. So that needs to be, that needs to be taken account into, in, in how we deal with these issues. But that same piece of research that, that Ofcom published also asked people what I thought was a particularly helpful question around what do people do if they experience a whole range of online harms. And what, what, what was really striking for me from that piece of research was only one in five people actually said that they had taken any action to deal with, um, with, with, with an online harm that they'd experienced. And that they, you know, a, mi a minority of people felt that they would use a, a report or had used a report button to, to, do some, to do something like that. There seemed to be a real gap between people's concern and potential experience of online harms and their knowledge about the routes by which they could proactively do something, do something about that. I mean, I, I think that is a challenge for, um, for industry for, for, and, and for, for, for regulation to, to, to play a role in, in, in tackling. So at the, the Carnegie UK Trust um, this year, we've been doing a, a whole series of work led by one of our trustees, William Perrin, and Professor Lorna Woods at Essex, the University of Essex, around what a, a, a regulator, regulatory system for tackling online harm, including hate speech, might, might, might look like. And we've proposed a, a duty of care model whereby, whereby platforms have a duty of care towards their, their users and they, they design at the system level, rather than about specific pieces of content, at the system level, ensure that systems minimise the likelihood of, of harm occurring to people who are using that platform and actually to non-users of that platform but for about whom content might be posted about. And the revenge porn example is a classic example of that where the, the individual who is experiencing the harm might not actually be a user of the platform but the, whom the duty of care should absolutely apply to. Um, and I think we, th we, we think that this, this model has... has as real opportunity because actually it takes that classic public policy position of setting the outcomes that we as a society want to achieve. We want to mar minimalize these experiences of harm, including, <laughs> including hate speech that people are experiencing. And it's saying, this is what we want to achieve. Okay, te technology companies, use your ex expertise, skills, technology to design your systems in a way that help deliver those outcomes. So you're not being overly prescriptive about how those achieved, but you are regulated, you have a, an independent regulator. We suggest an existing regulator because that would be more cost effective and, and could be done quite more quickly and, and have that in place to work with providers in a kind of co-regulatory approach to, to monitor and report on and, and seek to um, have a kind of virtuous circle of harm, of harm reduction. So we think that's a, um, an, effective, an effective way to tackle some of those issues. Brilliant. Thank you very much for that. Douglas, um, I'd just like to say, people, if you'd like to ask questions throughout, do feel free to throw your hands up. We are going to move on to the next section now. Um, but, so if you, well, yeah, if you'd like to ask a question now quickly.
Hi, my name is Abel Ashnair. I'm based at Aston Law School at Aston University in Birmingham. Um, I just want to pick up on the points raised by Jody in relation to do we need more regulation in terms of speech? And I agree that you know, law is not a one-stop shop solution for some of these problems. But I've, I kind of disagree um, in the sense that some of the topics that we've covered in terms of re revenge pornography or image-based abuse, they go beyond what's essentially a speech issue. Because from the victim's perspective, it's not just a freedom of speech issue, it's actually a criminal act, for example, in some cases at least. So the question we need to ask is, are existing laws capable of dealing with that appropriately? If not, we need legislation, and I don't think to classify it as a content <coughs> offence justifies the gravity of the, the offence. That, that's where I, I, I see it. So, for example, just to give the example of revenge pornography, I mean, there are debates regarding what's appropriate way to regulate it as a civil or criminal, but equally, I think the focus of the law really should be on the harassment element, lack of consent, rather than the image itself. The law has traditionally focused on the wrong thing. You just look at the image as a standalone concept, but what that image means to the victim is an entirely different matter. That's where you know, this debate goes beyond, slightly beyond a speech issue, and it becomes slightly of more of a conduct or a contact offence in some ways. I think we should have another microphone. If we could just bring that microphone up to the front, that'd be fantastic. So just to clarify, I don't disagree with you. I think there's points at which speech acts become other acts. You know, so a point at which repeatedly ringing somebody up and hurling kind of verbal abuse at them is not simply a free, you know, an exercise of free speech. It's harassment and abuse. What I'm saying is we need to be very careful about how we understand those things. Because at the moment, what's happening is people are, are on their own, if you like, on their own merits, deciding that content or speech uttered by other people is simply hate speech and therefore ought to be prosecuted. And that's where I think we need to be very careful. Because if we get into this territory in which it's possible for everybody to sort of define, make their own definitions of harm and hurt, then we get into a situation where it's very easy for people simply to restrict the speech, the speech of others whom they disagree with, politically, for example, or whom they disagree with on a matter of policy. We see this particularly at the moment in the transgender discussion, that the terms hate speech are being bandied around very, very widely in a way that is shutting down, I, in my view, legitimate discourse. And that has an implication not just for uh, freedom of expression, but for democracy more generally. So just to clarify, I'm not suggesting that no speech has has consequences that ought to, in some cases, result in criminal action. I think we just need to be very careful about continuing to expand the definition of those speech acts that should be considered criminal. Excellent. OK. Thank you for that. Um, I think we're going to move on now quickly, because I'm aware of time, to the next section, which is on cyberbullying and online marginalization. Um, I think we'll try and take some more, but. I'm just quite aware of time. We've got a lot to get through. Um, but we will take some more at the end of this section. Um, so, like I said, the, the next section on cyberbullying and online marginalization. I think just another open-ended question to kick it off. Um, we're rightly concerned with ensuring that online safety whilst children are concerned. But is there a risk that we go too far? Don't children have to learn how to protect themselves? And for that to happen, don't they need to be exposed to risk? And following on to that, I mean, is there, in other words, is there a desirable level of risk um, that we should be kind of identifying? Shall I um, kick off on that um, impossible question? Um, <laughs> so, um, yes and no. I mean, the theory of child <coughs> development is always going to say that people become resilient by facing some degree of risk within their existing capacity, um, having the resources and support with which to um, cope with that and um, become stronger as a result. What's happening online doesn't meet that, those kinds of um, 
criteria. So children, and indeed adults too, are exposed to all kinds of risk in a completely unmanaged way that may be way beyond their capacity to manage, and the level and array of support around them that would you know, traditionally, in the theory of developing resilience, um, that that level of support is not, by and large, available to them. So the theory is right, the practice is a long way from that theory, and um, cyberbullying, you know, if we, if we go with that, that word, but all the kinds of forms of um, online um, abuse, hostility, reputation damage, sometimes drama um, that is occurring is finding a, a wide range of different kinds of victims. So it, it does link very strongly, I think, to the question of marginalization. And um, so we can see in the research on children that um, children from ethnic minorities, children with um, disabilities, children who are recent migrants, you know, a whole range of children um, uh, in terms of sexuality. There's a whole range of, of, of those who are relatively more marginalized, who are um, more the victims of um, online abuse. but. Just to, just to add a couple of, a few complications. I mean, one is that we, in, the, in relation to children, there's quite a lot of research. And by and large, what we can see is a considerable overlap between, as it were, victims and perpetrators. Um, so there is, I think, as, um, as, as Barbara said earlier, uh, the, the levels of inequality, unhappiness, poverty, difficulty in society are what we're seeing manifest in the kinds of um, hostility and cyberbullying online. It doesn't, it doesn't come out of the blue just because it's a, a fun um, thing to do, or at least it doesn't um, uh, become harmful for that reason. Um, so, but in relation to adults, and I think it's um, brave of um, the um, uh, DCMS to write a white paper for the entire population, I think we really don't know um, how much bullying um, is experienced by adults um, and what, what character that has and what, what, what harms it results in. So I think there is a kind of a huge um, unknown in terms of the scale of the problem that we're now trying to um, regulate for. Just, just one, one thought in response to something that um, Douglas said earlier. So when we do get those statistics, I spend a lot of my life looking at the statistics on all the different kinds of harms to all the different kinds of people. They can seem um, quite low, and low we should be heartened by. We shouldn't always be trying to talk up the harms. Um, for children too, cyberbullying is reported by, um, let's say, between 5 and 15% of children, depending on how you measure it, which is a rabbit hole I won't go down now. Um, but 90% of children, we might say, and 90% of adults, all of those who are online, are now living on, in, in their online lives in a culture in which they have seen this, in which this is commonplace, in which all kinds of hostility and abuse and um, uh, aggression uh, are, are visible to everybody, including that which um, penalizes and, and targets um, minorities of, of many kinds. So I think, you know, just to sort of push back on the, uh, I mean, I, 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 as, as with Vicky, I'm completely, uh, I don't want to say anything that would undermine um, free speech, but I think we could use this argument for regulation to advance free speech because we don't have any handle yet on the chilling effect of living in an online environment in which all kinds of hostility and abuse is visible and in which there is evidently no penalty or um, a rebuke to those who, who, who do it. So it's an extraordinary world that, we're, that our children are growing up in um, and um, we, we just don't know how much is not said but what I see now talking to both children and parents is a very considerable degree of caution stepping in and risk of us kind of strategies emerging, which means that the very idea now of exploring the internet, experimenting online, making new friends online, all of these things that we thought were the very purpose and pleasure and promise of the internet now sound like crazy strategies to put yourself, um, to make yourself a victim. And people are becoming very risk averse about the online world, and I think that will damage the um, democratic space, the free speech possibilities, and indeed the market opportunities. Okay. Um, 
I've got five points, which I'll make quite make briefly to um, give us as much time for discussion as possible. Firstly, just to kind of like, reinforce exactly what, what Sonia says, and you probably know these, fig these figures better than me, actually, Sonia, but I think it's more than a quarter of children say so that they feel more, it more able them they feel more themselves online than yep. they do offline, which really then reinforces the nature that the online environment really matters in terms of the culture in which children are being brought up, if that's where they're feeling their true personality is actually able to be expressed. Um, secondly, point, I don't think we've, we've talked yet about mental health, um, mm -hmm. yet more statistics out today amongst, about rising mental health difficulties, particularly amongst young women. I think we're still in relatively early evidential phase in terms of the l l linkages between those and between us living in a digital world, but I dare say that you know, we will see more and more of that, that research coming through over the years, which, which, which finds relationships between, between those, those things. Partly that's linked to um, the two, two other things, I think. The speed of which our interaction is online and the in way in which conver uh, conversation moves so quickly um, and can and broaden to include um, a huge range of people um, really matters and I think has, a, has impacts upon how people experience, experience things. And also the pervasive nature of, of our, our online communication, the 24-7 um, 24 seven nature of it. The fact that it's very, particularly for, for children and young people, very difficult to move away to a space which is removed from that. Um, and what does, again, what, does, what implications does that have for the kind of the type of society that we are and, and the outcomes and, and, and so on that we, we experience. And then I think absolutely to support the point around that, that and, and we see this actually in online in lots of different ways, not, not just around safety, but actually around just being included in the first place that, um, that it deepens things that already exist offline. So if we are, we are seeing things, people becoming more marginalised offline, the likelihood is that, that these issues around speed and pervasiveness will lead to an accentuation of that in an, in an, online, an online world. So we have to understand that whilst, that, that whilst online um, can, does things in a certain way and so does certain things differently, it is in no way kind of completely removed and separate from how we live our lives um, um, more generally. I think, just so I think Bob wants to tap in. So if we could just... I want to make sure that uh, I, uh, from, you know, I'm from Freedom of Expression Organization, but we obviously recognize that the phenomenon you describe are there and are very problematic and deplorable, and we recognize that they can cause real harm. However, our, uh, we also point out, and I would disagree here with um, Sandra here, that you know, we are risk averse to introduce the measures for in, in, in sake of protecting freedom of speech, and then we are disregarding the dangers this speech causes. Because in our experience, it's quite opposite. Uh, in our experience, uh, which has been documented not just by Article 19, but by many other organizations, is when we don't take protection of freedom of speech sufficiently into consideration when introducing this tool, it actually leads to further marginalization and further, uh, further exclusion of those marginalized societies. So let's say uh, Twitter uh, started to Im impose the prohibit the word queer. So any, uh, any mentions on the queer would be removed because it's considered offensive, regardless of the context. Is this conducive to inclusion of queer, society, queer uh, groups and individuals in the society? No. So we disagree with the, uh, the, with the claim that there is a risk aversion for free speech protection, quite opposite. And we are actually showing how freedom of expression guarantees and transparency in particular can help to address some of those problems. Because to a greater extent, we don't know what these companies are doing. And now I'm talking about the ecosystem of the companies and we should actually be uh, really mindful of the fact that uh, one fits for all approach is not going to solve anything because we should not be treating you know, Mumsnet or Tumblr in the same way as we treat Facebook or Twitter and those companies which have a dominant position. So we really need to have a further understanding how people experience different platforms, what is the harm and, um, and some sort of dangerous consequences of experience on those platforms and what are the different responsibilities. Unless we define who is, uh, what is the harm and what is the responsibility, we'll not be able to, uh, to come, uh, to, come to, to, to solutions. And also uh, to, to uh, respond to the earlier question which said that like, you, know, you can't expect parents to tell uh, children what is legal and what is not and you know, who decides what is legal and what is not. I didn't suggest that parents should tell uh, the children what is legal. It's not their role. The parents should be teaching kids values and 
uh, and it's not illegal to be mean, but still you can expect your kids to be kind to others and, and so on. But uh, there is a responsibility for the state to uh, define the threshold. And as also Jody said, the threshold is already defined. And the problem is enforcement and inconsistent and, and transparent enforcement. And we know from maybe anecdotal evidence of the problems with this problematic enforcement. And then we allow further on to go that way, which is we want to prevent. I just wanted to pick up uh, two points. One is, again, I would agree, the chilling effect is huge. I think we would all agree on that. I think where we disagree is the solutions for those problems. So in one corner, you have people who think that the solutions to this unfettered speech that is preventing others from speaking out is to ban the people who are the noisiest. And in the other corner, which is where I would sit and Barbora would sit, we would argue that the way to, to tackle the chilling effect of those is to raise up other voices and find mechan other mechanisms other than formal bans with which to deal with the problematic discourse. So that's the first thing. I think what we, I think we would all agree around the chilling effect, it's the way that you would tackle that. The second thing I want to say, and, and this really relates to the point that you raised, Vicky, about the parents who are scared to look certain things up because they don't know if they might be breaking the law. I think that perfectly illustrates the point about what happens when you start to prescribe the kinds of expression that is allowed and is not allowed. And we know, for example, from work that we've done in universities that, for example, the implementation of prevent legislation is having an enormous chilling effect on expression in universities, for example, and, and from your evidence, potentially on parents who want to find out more but think that they can't find out more about radicalization because they might find themselves flagged as someone who is involved in radicalization themselves. And I think that demonstrates perfectly the dangers when you start to expand the, the kinds of content or expression that are and are not allowed because they scoop up both legitimate inquiry with criminal intent. I think it's the perfect time to open it up to the floor, actually. I see people with their hands up, so... Yeah, a gentleman there. Hi, um, I'm, my name's Adam Kinsley um, from Sky. Um, listen, really interested to both sides of the debate here, uh, but it seems to me that um, both sides of the debate could um, agree on one thing, which is the need for um, some more transparency of the processes uh, that are currently in place on platforms, um, which is why I think that the, this side of the debate from Sonia um, and from Carnegie Trust is saying that there needs to be some sort of independent oversight of the processes that are in play, whether you think that that's because you, um, there's too much harm on the platforms or because there's not enough, uh, or, or because platforms might be banning words like queer, both, both of those could do with uh, somebody independent to oversee that and shine a light on the processes. I, I, on that, can you both agree? Both sides. Um, um, I, th I think so. Um, I would hope so. I mean, the Twitter example to me is exactly um, an example of why we don't want to leave it to the platforms, because it's, it seems to me a, a, a daft policy, which is um, going to have all kinds of negative consequences. I mean, I, I think also, at the moment, what we seem to have is a police force which is um, completely overwhelmed with the, the how to address the scale of the problem. Platforms who are trying to kind of salvage their reputations by taking all kinds of rather hasty actions in unaccountable ways. And schools who are being kind of pointed to it, well, you should teach kids how to be sensible and kind in a pretty crazy world. So I, th I mean, I think the argument is that there needs to be another player in what is a very complicated ecology. And I might throw the question back to Jodie, who I don't think I disagree with as much as she thinks. But I, w I, I don't know who's going to raise up those other voices. Who is going to call on the other voices to take other kinds of actions to quell or to um, down rank, as it were, certain um, hostile voices. I don't know where, you know, it, it just doesn't seem to me sufficient to say we have the police, we have schools, we have... Uh, pa parents and children are absolutely um, becoming risk averse. You know, I would, I would stand by the research there. I think anyone who's talked to parents and children recently um, can see it happening, teachers um, similarly. So there needs to be some other players, it were, to revive the idea 
um, that this can be a free space for um, all kinds of other things to be said and not to let the trolls win. So very quickly, I think, A, that is happening. I think yeah. movements like Me Too demonstrate that, that there is a kind of collective power that people do use for good. So I think when we keep talking about risk aversion and safety, we forget, I think, that the enormous power, positive power, that both the internet and speech can have. And I think those kinds of movements demonstrate that. Uh, in response to the Sky question, yes, I think there is room for some kind of independent oversight body, but I don't think we should underestimate the scale of the problem. Um, I think Facebook receives something like a million complaints a day about uh, content on the platform, and trying to work out a system in which that can, the, the most egregious examples of them implementing or, or um, exercising their terms of conditions in a way that they shouldn't, it is going to be extraordinarily complex, I think, even just to capture the tiny number of those. I think uh, David just, likes... Oh. Just a very quick comment, actually, to Sky question as well. I agree, and actually Article 19 already proposed a similar mechanism. We call it Social Media Council. But with the caveat that the, the standards should be, or you know, overall uh, values and standards should be the same, but then they should be... Uh, apply to different platforms differently and here we have a dominant platforms you know Facebook Twitter Google that have different responsibilities as those smaller ones and the one uh, approach fits all fits all would be actually dangerous because it would not distinguish sufficiently between the usability and also you can't uh, in enforce Facebook kind of solutions to smaller platforms because you want to make them competitive and also they will not have the resources. So yes, but with the caveat of tailor-made solutions based for platforms. I think, I think that, that David, um, if we could just get David to make a point quickly yeah, of course. and then Douglas and then we're going to move on to the final <laughs> section where Andrew's going to talk. Thank you, Alex. Yeah, so it's really a point um, picking up on uh, Sonia's uh, part about um, our, our, um, our services that are there to support children. So we kind of talked about law enforcement uh, and the point I made earlier on about their, their, their understanding uh, and the, the point about schools um, and also probably mental health services uh, or our teenage mental health services as well, I think are, are in lots of ways just completely overwhelmed. And, and in lots of cases, um, it becomes too complicated. It's too complex. Uh, it becomes overwhelming and so often nothing happens. So some da data in terms of, so from 13,000 schools in the UK, despite this being in schools in England, a, a statutory obligation, 46% um, of schools don't have any form of professional development programme in this particular case. I think because it is often just too, uh, too complicated. So I, 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 this, this point around the capability of those working and tasked with working with children um, is, is lacking too. Um, I, just to briefly say, I think the point about regulation at that system level <coughs> is, is absolutely right. And, it's very important we're talking about system level regulation, not content level regulation. And what, what we're proposing, what, the, what we're talking about, is through the duty of care, as you set, you define the set of outcomes that you wish to achieve, and then you, and then you um, task platforms with, with, um, with reaching those and ensuring that their systems do the things that they need to do in order to, in order to deliver on that. And there are some pretty obvious things that those systems are likely to include, like age verification policies, parental controls, queer terms and conditions, complaints mechanisms and redress mechanisms, which while Facebook might have in place, not all platforms have in place, and it's, um, it's, it's the whole point about it is to bring a higher degree of transparency and consistency and a greater preventative approach across, across the whole landscape, while still giving the freedom to platforms to actually use their own expertise, their own knowledge of their own platform, their own ability to innovate, to actually continue to implement new solutions in order to help achieve that overall outcome. And then the crucial role of that independent regulatory function is then to be able to, to share across industry, across, with civil society, get civil society's input to say, actually, these are the mechanisms that appear to be working. Let's, um, let's continue to improve. So it becomes a process of continuous improvement towards that agreed set of outcomes that, that as a society, we define that we wish to achieve. Brilliant. Okay, so I think we're going to move swiftly on to the last section. We are overrunning slightly, so apologies about that, but I think we're going, to, um, we're going to listen to Andrew now from DCMS. He's going to speak around the white paper for five or so minutes, then we will take comments and questions, um, but like I said, let's swiftly move it, move it through. Okay. Am I talking from here? Or? You can talk from there, I think. The <laughs> no, it's fine. Uh, the, the, the goldfish are static now, I think. For now. The, gold, the goldfish aren't swimming around very much. No, uh, the, the least active goldfish uh, that 
Anyway, so th um, thank you very much for inviting me, and thank you for a really interesting discussion, which uh, I've been uh, listening to with a lot of interest. And um, just to say, I'm Andrew Honeyman from the Online Harms White Paper team at the Debar Department for Digital, Culture, Media, and Sport. Is that better? Can everybody hear me now? Good. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the background to the white paper and then a few, a bit about what might be in it. So um, obviously with limitations on, on what I can say about content. But um, so in terms of background, we published our Internet Safety Strategy Green Paper last October. We followed that with a public consultation. We published the government response to that in May of this year. The consultation highlighted three main issues. So. Online behaviours too often fail to meet acceptable standards. Users can feel powerless to address these issues. And technology companies can operate without proper oversight, transparency or accountability. And commercial interests can often mean that they can fail to act in users' best interests. So in that government response in May, uh, we announced our intention, intention to publish a joint DCMS Home Office white paper to set out some more definitive steps on online harms and safety, including proposals for future legislation. And this represented a shift in our approach, which previously focused much more on voluntary action and expanded the scope of our work to cover both harmful and illegal content, and hence then the link to the Home Office. Uh, as we progress this work, we're determined that we should be, UK should be a world leader uh, in terms of innovation-friendly regulation that both encourages uh, the tech sector and provides stability for business. And we're very conscious that this is a, a new and really difficult area. And as uh, Sonia and others have pointed out, we've got a real challenge on our hands. Um, this internet safety workforce within the digital charter, as the minister talked about, uh, earlier on, and our work recognises the, the hugely positive aspects of being online. Um, We're considering how government can ensure that all users, including children, are able to access these benefits while also managing the risks. Uh, so, uh, uh, as the Minister said, we're aiming to publish the white paper in the winter. Um, it's likely to contain a mixture of legislative and non-legislative measures. Um, as a, as I say, we're talking and listening to stakeholders uh, all the time at the moment, including this event today. Um, uh, there's a limit to what I can say about the content, but in terms of the principles that, are, that under, are underpinning our work, so freedom of expression is right up there. Similarly, promoting growth and innovation, protecting SMEs and startups. Um, Adaptability, so we use the word future-proof, making sure that whatever we introduce can, is adaptable enough to, to, to cope with the developments that we simply can't anticipate at the moment. Um, as Sonia alluded to, the ch one of the challenges we have is to keep the scope of the white paper manageable and feasible to introduce. <coughs> um, Douglas mentioned the duty of care model of regulation, which uh, Carnegie Trust and others are promoting. NSPC, uh, NSPCC are talking about something similar. Um, we're talking to, to those people. We're really interested uh, in that idea. It's clearly it's not the only one that's out there. Um, and similarly, they're interested in the, in the paper that Sonia mentioned from the LSE uh, uh, about a new independent agency. Um, I think it's worth saying, as well as kind of keeping the scope of the white paper manageable, uh, it's not going to be the end of the journey by any means. We're not going to cover everything uh, in there. We won't crack everything. Um, there will be a consultation uh, alongside the white paper uh, and so on. And then, as, as I say, we'll, we'll be, it's likely that we'll be looking to introduce legislation after that. Uh, just a few things about what <coughs> what's likely to be in the white paper. So. Um, as part of the government response in May, we published a draft transparency reporting template so we can better understand the extent of potentially harmful behaviours and content online, um, and also users' awareness and the, and the use of reporting mechanisms. So we're talking to social media providers and others to refine the arrangements for transparency reporting, uh, conscious that that draft that we published um, wasn't perfect. And likewise, the draft social media code of practice that was also in that um, 
uh, in the government response in May. Uh, it's kind of interesting that recently YouTube and Facebook have both published their own transparency report, so it's in kind of encouraging to see some progress in this area. Uh, as I said, uh, there's likely to be some non-legislative uh, action as well as the uh, potentially legislation. So, uh, think safety first uh, is is an area we're really interested in, um, considering the opportunity for technical solutions. Um, for example, many social media platforms use privacy settings to enable users to decide who they share information with and who can contact them. Our think safety first builds on this, uh, as we set out in the government response. To create a safer digital ecosystem, we need to influence the development of new and emerging platforms. We want to support developers and designers to include safety features in new applications and platforms from the start so that we're not having to retrofit. And we'll be setting out further details about this work in the white paper. Um, it's very much a cross-government white paper, so we're talking to colleagues in the Department for Education as well. Um, during some of the focus groups we rang uh, with young people, digital literacy, which is already part of the school curriculum, was highlighted as being something that's really important in terms of giving children the tools they need to make smart choices online, helping them to critically interpret what they see. Uh, so we're working with DfE on the online safety aspects of the curriculum. And similarly, we're working with uh, the Department for Health and Social Care uh, in relation to young people's mental health and social media. Uh, our work will be informed by um, the Chief Medical Officer's review of the impact that ta technology has on young people's mental health, which is due to be published uh, early next year. And similarly, you may be aware that the Information Commissioner's Office is developing an age-appropriate design code. And the code will provide guidance on the design standards that the Commissioner will expect uh, providers of online services uh, which process personal data like to be accessed by children to meet. Um, the Minister spoke about the UK Council for Internet Safety. It's a really important group for us. They've previously published guidance on issues such as, such as sexting and tackling race and faith targeted bullying. Um, so look, the internet clearly is something which cuts across every aspect of modern life. It's crucial we take, we take a collaborative approach on this, and so we're engaging as much as we can uh, as we take this forward uh, our, with our new expanded scope of both harmful and illegal activities. Uh, and we're aiming that we hope that by working with this wide range of stakeholders, we'll see some real progress taking forward online safety initiatives so that everyone, including children and young people, can access the benefits of the internet successfully. Thank you very much for that, Andrew. I think we'll take one comment each from each panelist, and then if we have time, quickly open it out to the floor. So if we'd like to start with Sonia and just move down, one comment or question. Um, so I really welcome the breadth of what you um, just outlined, um, and I think the really crucial task then that I'm hoping you'll also deal with comes back to these questions of process. The challenge is going to be one of coordination and of compliance. And at the moment, we, you know, some of us have lived through a lot of codes of practice of different platforms and different bodies, um, and they get announced with a great fanfare, and I've not yet seen them being evaluated and implemented. I think we really need to move into the world in which we evaluate what works and we really begin to learn from what's working, um, and we make sure that really crucial parts of the overall picture don't fall between the gaps of those different ministries and different actions, but it sounds very promising. Thank you. I agree. <clears throat> it sounds incredibly promising, and I think what is particularly gratifying, if, if I'm with Sonia, I feel as though I've lived through quite a few phases of these different initiatives, but actually this one does feel as though we're in a new stage of the conversation, and it's a stage of the conversation that feels very productive and possibly more productive than, than the years where it all fell to self-regulation or it all <coughs> fell to parents or it all fell to schools. This does feel as though it's a much more collaborative and, and hopefully a more productive stage. I guess what pops into my head is the um, future-proofing. I think of the young woman that was speaking earlier on talking about AI and how that was going to influence future jobs and how we needed to be starting to talk to young people now about what their career options might be and how AI might be part of that 
picture. I know she had three forms of AI, but I'll take the first one. Um, and I, th I, I think protecting that, which goes hand in hand with this issue of not creating a country that is incredibly risk averse, I absolutely agree with Sonia on the issue of families becoming more risk averse. They absolutely are. Parents are becoming more nervous about the internet. And that really, that really is a, a problem if we are hoping to uh, raise children who will benefit from the opportunities that digital will give them. So I hope that its name is all about internet safety, but I hope its ambition is about making sure that uh, we all get to flourish online and not just stay safe, because that's, that's quite a low baseline. Yeah, totally. And uh, I think in terms of, we're really conscious of the importance of the role of parents. There's, there's an education str strand, I think, not just for children, but for parents and companies too, actually, um, to help parents have the confidence to deal with some of these issues. Uh, and I think that that's going to be a really important part. Um, you mentioned the, the engagement that we, we've, we've had with you, Andrew, during the process. We've, um, we've been very grateful for that and we enjoyed that and um, obviously very happy to continue liaising on, on that duty of care proposal as, as you develop things over the next, next few months. Um, I was also going to pick future proofing, really, really jumps out as something we haven't really talked about yet this morning, but you mentioned that very, very important indeed. Um, and that the opportunities to do, to set these kind of core, core systems, if you like, won't, won't come that often. We don't want to be doing them every year. Whilst this is a start of a journey, we don't want to have something in place that isn't having to be adapted every few months when the next technological innovation comes through. So it's absolutely vital. Interestingly, the, um, there was, it was clarified in, in the House of Lords quite recently that the, the health and safety at work legislation, which was passed in the 1970s, is, is defined as being applicable for, for AI. Um, so a piece, of, a piece of legislation which could not possibly have envisaged how AI might be used in the workplace when it was first passed was designed in such a way to be future-proofing. So that, that kind, of, kind of work is, is, is possible, and, um, and hopefully we can do something similarly, similarly effective here. So. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thank you very much, and we also appreciate that you involved civil society already in this initial stage in discussion about the white paper. So from my perspective, I think the biggest challenge for you will be how to link this with the online harms with uh, making UK also very competitive and linking it to the to the digital charter and um, how, to, how to fix the problems on the market through the regulation. And I think that here the challenge is again what I said earlier, not to enforce the dominant platform system on the smaller platforms because then you know you remove the competitiveness in this sense. And um, I think that this paper also needs to be really rooted in understanding the ecosystem of the internet and how it works and also how data it's a data-driven market and how advertisers also influence this ecosystem. So without also addressing and looking for the solutions, how the self-regulation in advertisement already offers some solutions here and how this can be promoted. And that links back to the competitive nature of the market and how you want to link it to that as well. Yes, so to echo the future-proofing point, my children are 9 and 11. I can't ever imagine them using Facebook, for example. They just, it doesn't feature on their radar, and I doubt it ever will because that's not the technologies they're using or that they're growing up with. It's absolutely vital that we involve those kinds of children, not my, necessarily my children, they'd be horrified if I suggested that they, um, but uh, young people who are using all four sorts of different technologies in this discussion. It's absolutely key. The second thing I think is also uh, points to Vicky and Sonia's points. Risk aversion is, is becoming a huge problem online. That's a huge problem for freedom of expression. It's a huge challenge for all sorts of other things. But recognizing that I think means that, that DCMS and others need to think very carefully about how this whole debate and narrative is framed. So this white paper started out, the green paper started out as the internet safety strategy. It's now become the online harms department. We need to think very carefully about how we are wording and describing these things. You talk about safety first, safety by design. It's really important that we think about protection of human rights 
by design, that we put those things first as well. So I would really urge you and the others in your team to think very hard about the narrative that you are um, promoting when you are in discussions about this work. Okay, so the final point, I guess. Uh, there was a particular, uh, just a particular um, reference, I think, um, I would very much encourage in terms of the uh, um, our online harms paper. So talking to DFE, um, uh, clearly um, education is delegated and so I would very much encourage the conversation with the Welsh Government, Scottish Government and the Northern Ireland Executive because they have clearly have different curriculums uh, as well. So please not to forget those, given it is a UK-wide um, uh, UK paper. But very much, I think, from a presenter's perspective, applauding um, the efforts. So these sorts of conversations aren't going on um, elsewhere in the world. And so I think so that the point the Minister made earlier on around we do kind of lead uh, online safety globally, um, it, it is really much enc encouraging and so we applaud that, that effort, especially at a time that is um, consuming in terms of Brexit, consuming um, ministerial and political and everybody's time, I'm sure. So I uh, would, would just encourage that, that, that conversation, the dialogue uh, as well. There can be little as important as protecting our children. Excellent, okay, well. Oh, yeah, quick response. No, I think that's really helpful. Uh, all those comments are, are taken on board. I think um, we are talking to the devolved administrations. Um, I think the point about the narrative is spot on. We need to make sure that we're getting the balance right and, and getting the language right, uh, and that's a challenge for us. Um, we are at, we're certainly not just looking at the dominant platforms. It's, uh, we're looking at uh, SMEs and startups as well, uh, uh, and, and so on. So, yeah, I think, I think these are all really helpful points we take on board. Brilliant. Okay, unfortunately, we don't have time to open up to the floor. Um, what I would say is that we've got a lunch break. We've got another coffee break. I know the speakers will be happy to talk more about this. Um, so please do kind of carry on chatting about this throughout the day. Um, I think we wanted to show with this event sort of the level of interest um, in this area and kind of capture the debate that's going on offline about what we need to do online. And I, hopefully, we've done that. Um, I think that what Vicky said about this being like it's, it's a new phase of conversation was very interesting and it feels more collaborative. I think that's a very good thing. I think it fits with both the objectives of the UK IGF and also the theme of today, which is solutions for the digital age. So I think, yeah, I think it was a great debate. Thank you to everyone who contributed. Sorry to those who didn't have time to contribute and yeah, thank you very much.